All right, good morning, everyone, or when you see this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Dolly. I am the president of the Wisconsin High School Esports Association. And I'm going to be talking to you about esports here in the state of Wisconsin, a little bit around the country, and maybe even a little bit globally. Um, so a little bit more background about myself. Um, I am a current business education teacher at Elkhorn High School this year. Uh, the last two and a half years, I was an instructional systems designer. Uh, which developed a lot of e-learning and training for major industry companies like John Deere, Komatsu, Steel, um, and stuff like that. Uh, I was also an LMS administrator while there, um, controlling all of our um, all of our courses and all of our users that were accessing our training. Uh, and then, for the last two years, um, I've been the president of the Wisconsin High School Esports Association. We are our official nonprofit here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, before we weren't, um, and I was just kind of running everything uh, around the state. Um, I am essentially part part community manager, part social media marketing, uh, part graphic designer, part shoutcaster, part event organizer, uh, part coach. Um, I wear a lot of different hats uh, throughout the organization. Like last night, I spent until about eight o'clock um, after I got home from school. Uh, making the schedule for this upcoming semester competition so and then previously as well I've been a Microsoft I2E which is insight to execution uh, consultant uh, for their esports division um, I'm also currently working with UW Waukesha uh, and a, a number of other uh, universities around around the state and country to help develop programs and curriculum and stuff like that to benefit our students so um, Besides who I am, you can probably see in the background over here, um, that's my dog Danny. He likes to sit on the perch there and look out the window. So uh, he may make an appearance on a video. He makes a lot of appearances on, on my conference calls and webinars because he likes to sit right back there by me. Uh, so yeah, this is our logo for the Wisconsin High School Esports Association. Uh, what is our mission? Uh, our mission uh, is to govern, support, and promote the growth of high school esports throughout community development, advocacy, equitable participation, and interscholastic competition to enrich the educational experience. What is esports? Well, it's uh, a form of competitive video games, right? Uh, it's been around since the 1970s when Pong and some of the Atari classics came out. Um, it really boomed in the 90s uh, when StarCraft and WarCraft were, came, were like really popular. Those are real-time strategy games. Um, and in 2000, Korea created KESPA uh, and became the first country to formalize competition. So South Korea is usually considered to be a world leader within esports. Um, I've, been, I've done some work with KESPA as well, um, trying to find uh, a way in order to bring them over here to come in and do coaching clinics and about how to start up organizations and um, trying to get some some Korean pros to come over and, and kind of show you what real pro life is like. Um, how is it played? Uh, most esports competition is run um, online through the game client itself. Um, there are LANs, obviously, uh, kind of given COVID, there really aren't too many lands or uh, physical spots uh, being used. Um, for example, one of the very largest fighting game community tournaments is actually held here in Wisconsin um, at the Kalahari in the Wisconsin Dells. Uh, it's called Smash and Splash. It's, a, it's an A-tier tournament, which means that you'll have pros flying from all around the world to come and compete here in the Wisconsin Dells. Uh, the other year, I'm pretty sure they fully booked the Kalahari. Um, I know they had to rent out blocks of rooms at the other hotels really close by because there were so many people that were coming to Smash and Splash. So really cool to see a lot of that starting to pop up around here in the state. Uh, what does the pro scene look like? Um, this is really cool to me. Um, so this is a picture I took. Um, I went to the Intel Extreme Masters at the Counter-Strike event. Uh, this one took place at the Wintrust Arena in Chicago. It's where the DePaul Blue Demons play uh, collegiate basketball. Um, after this event, they were actually moving it to the United Center. And um, they've been actually doing really well um, hosting it at the United Center. They, they've seen about 30 to 40% attendance growth over the last five years for this event. So um, about a quarter million dollar prize pool available. 
uh, one of the top teams in the world there, Astralis, came from, I believe, Sweden or Denmark. Um, and they are considered to be the best of the best for, for CSGO. Um, for this event alone, there was about 5 million hours watched online. Um, and this event here, there was, uh, it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event where Saturday was the semifinals and then Sunday was just the finals. Um, so there was about 10,000 in, in attendance. On this day here, there was about, I would say probably about three to 4,000 people that were there. Um, you can't see that every seat is full here, but um, like outside, um, around the, the viewing area here, there were tons of um, PC companies there. There was a lot of apparel companies. There was a lot of uh, brand engagement happening behind the scenes. Um, they used really cool augmented reality um, with their app. So there were a lot of people walking around with like t-shirts um, and you actually had to like stop them, have a conversation with them and then scan the QR code on their, on their shirt. And then on your phone, it opened up um, a little chest and you spun it around and opened it, and uh, and like I won, I won a, a like a T-shirt. Uh, my buddy won uh, an extended long gaming um, mouse pad. So there was tons of things that they were giving away. They were giving away like a two thousand dollar PC to the winner as well. They were giving away like curved gaming monitors and stuff like that. So I mean, there was there was a ton that went into this production value. Uh, one of my favorite things for brand engagement here for this pro scene was everybody got, um, like I'm wearing a Fitbit here, everybody got one of these, um, not a Fitbit, but uh, something comparable. And when they planted the bomb in the game, um, so for those of you that don't know, your, your goal in CSGO is to, to plant a bomb. And as it would tick, and a beep, 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 there would be a little orange light that would start flashing. So everybody in the stadium that's wearing one of these, it would start flashing red. And as the timer went down, like beep, 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 right before detonation, everybody's thing was flashing. And then if the bomb went off, the entire arena would flash whatever color team won. Um, so it was really cool to see this whole arena just like flashing and then boom. Um, so it was, it was pretty neat to see. Uh, Another way that the pro scene looks like is these two gentlemen operate um, 100 Thieves. They are a professional organization out in California. Um, they just built uh, the Cash App compound. It's about 15,000 square feet. Uh, there's four training pods. There's a full cafeteria. There's a content creation studio. There's an apparel hub, a full basketball court. Um, and they are quickly becoming one of the most popular brands. Uh, within the esports world and it's not because they're having tons of success um, on the game i'm gonna say on the gaming pitch um, but their brand of clothing their brand of style their um, community engagement is extremely high um, and as you can see here they are they are partially owned by drake and uh and the cleveland cavaliers owner as well so um, this is a really really up and coming brand their their value has exploded um, over the last three years since they really entered the scene so really cool there uh, this is more local uh, this is the Milwaukee Bucks and their Bucks gaming um, center here so this is inside their new uh, arena here you can kind of see that the Bucks have um, they have an NBA 2k team um, they haven't branched out yet into other uh, titles yet, but they're focusing primarily on NBA 2K. Um, I work closely with Andrew Buck um, at Bucks Gaming. He's the, the manager for the organization. Uh, they're doing some really cool work. Um, it's, it's just really awesome to see something local. Uh, to give you an idea for NBA 2K, they do have like a combine, they have a draft, and um, if you get and I, I don't know if this is up to date information, but I know like the first time that they did the NBA 2K season, um, players that were drafted in the first round, I believe received $40,000 a year. Um, you get an apartment paid for within the host city. Um, they have personal trainers, uh, they have nutritionists, um, so they can actually cater everything that their players need. Uh, if you're taking in like the second or later rounds, I believe it was like 30 or 35,000. But I mean, that's a pretty living wage when you have an apartment paid for and you have a lot of your food um, 
prepared for you and, and brought to you. Um, so that way you can just continue to hone your craft. Uh, this here is a picture of the League of Legends World Championship um, from a couple of years ago. Uh, the, the championship is actually happening tomorrow um, in China. Um, they are not having spectators, unfortunately. But what I do think that that means is that the viewership for the World Championship tomorrow on Saturday, which is between um, Damwon Gaming, which is a Korean organization, and Sunin, which is a Chinese organization, I will be willing to bet that they will probably have a larger viewership than the Super Bowl, the um, uh, the World Series, um, the Stanley Cup, and you can throw NASCAR and pretty much any other American sport, and the viewership will will be much greater than all of those combined. Um, usually the League of Legends World Championship, the only thing that it doesn't get out viewed by is the World Cup. Um, but it is, it is probably the second largest viewed event in the world. So how valuable is it? Um, right now it's estimated to be about $1.6 billion uh, dollar industry by 2023. Um, here you can look at some of the valuable brands um, here, Cloud9 is a North American based one. It's valued at about $310 million as of last year. Um, that value could have gone up. TSM at a, a quarter of a billion dollars. Team Liquid at $200 million. Um, so there's a ton of money that's happening with these brands. Um, a lot of them here in North America are buying into franchise um, structures which I really don't like um, for our pro sports teams because um, there's not in my opinion, there's not a lot of incentive uh, in order to, to try to keep improving your team and roster and spend money to, to try to get a championship. Like, I'm a Chicago Fire fan, and they have been consistently the worst team in the MLS for basically since, like, 1998 when they won their first championship. And ever since then, they've been, they've been hot garbage. But because there's no chance of them being relegated, there's no chance of them um, being removed from the league for poor performance. Um, they still continue to get a cut of the revenue, but I digress. Um, and then again, yeah, as far as viewership in 2018, there's 380 million viewers uh, for competitive tournaments. There's a, nearly 80 million hours watched for just the League of Legends Championship. Um, and then the International, which is Dota 2, um, had about 64 million hours watched. I mean, I even watched it. I have no idea what's happening in Dota, but I still watch it. Um, it's just fascinating. Here are a lot of brands that are involved. Um, a lot of, um, obviously, a lot of tech um, brands are really highly involved within this. Um, we're starting to see a lot of major brands like Snickers, Geico, Honda, um, Hyundai. Like they're, they're starting to be, we're starting to see a lot of branches going out to traditional um, branding companies or, or large-scale products that are starting to come in here as well. So even Allstate Insurance is a sponsor for the League of Legends World Championship this year. Then the big question is, how are they engaging their audience? Um, with eSports, there's, I'm, I've broken it down here into essentially three branches. Number one, brand engagement. So where are people interacting with, with your brand? Um, in a professional sense, most of that is being handled through Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and again, that's professional interaction, professional engagement, people that are looking for sponsorships or reaching out to other brands for, uh, to do collaborations and stuff like that. Most of that starts on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and then content creation, um, just creating daily content, bringing more views to your brand. Um, is handled almost entirely through Twitch and to YouTube. Um, and then user engagement, just really getting involved and bringing people to your brand. Discord is huge. Um, there, there's companies all across the country that are hiring Discord community managers because it just brings people together underneath your brand to interact with it. Uh, and then of course, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, all of those are major user engagement ones uh, to be able to, because it's really cool to be able to interact sometimes with the pros and get them to actually like call something out to you. 
how we, as the Wisconsin High School Esports Association, are engaging our brand. I actually took screenshots of our social media platforms. Um, consider that these are, are right around the beginning of the school year this year. Um, so th this is our Facebook one. So here you can see how our posts are doing, um, how much engagement that we're getting, how much reach that we have. Uh, Facebook is not our target audience. Um, we know that. We, we have this page here primarily because this is where parents and teachers still are. Um, so here we try to curtail our message a little bit to be like, um, you know, positive things that gaming is doing within communities to show parents that this is worthwhile um, or in order to expand to other schools so that people can tag other teachers and stuff like that. Our primary um, is Twitter. Um, we are huge on Twitter. We are probably one of the largest, um, we are one of the largest high school state associations in the country. Um, so again, you can kind of see here, we're, we're hitting about, if you do a comparison here, we have nearly 1,100 profile visits. Uh, but if you look over here, we barely cracked 200 on, uh, 200 reached on our, on our Facebook page. So we're having five times the amount of success on Twitter. Um, and this is where, again, tons of our engagement comes from, um, a lot of where our interaction is. So the big thing about esports is that there is a major difference, right? Um, we look at traditional distribution within marketing and we kind of see there's a producer, a wholesaler, or a retailer, and then it gets to the end consumer, right? There are these different channels that products work through. Um, whereas esports, this is it, right? It's a producer um, who's making the intellectual property and then it's directly going to the consumer. They get to control everything. There's no middle person within this. There's no additional um, uh, there's no additional channels that are really done here between game developers and then their end product. Um, and what this does is it means that they can really control their intellectual property. They can control who uses it. They can control how people organize using their, their content or their, their IP. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. If you want to look, there are specific community guidelines. So we've had to apply for these in order to run some of these tournaments. Um, so, for example, I've applied to Blizzard. We have an official Blizzard community license um, this year. Um, Cyanix ha has one. We haven't had to fill that out, though, uh, because we don't meet some of the criteria within it. Um, and then Riot. Riot came out with a huge one this year, and it's going to be a huge blow nationally. Um, but what it says is right here. Right, so this is a legal document. Um, this is something that organizations like ours have to adhere to, um, otherwise we can have to go up against their legal department. And let's be honest, we don't have the money uh, to go and battle the largest game developer in the world right now. Um, so what this says here is number one, competitions must start and finish within 14 days. Okay? We run an eight week season with two weeks of playoffs and then a state championship. So number one, can't do that. No more than 16 schools may participate in a given competition, okay? Last year we had 60 high schools competing in just League of Legends for varsity. Um, and now, you know, this year we went from 70 schools to like 115 that are going to be competing this year. So number two, we can't follow those guidelines. Number three, uh, competitions may not be sponsored or sanctioned by an esports governing body. If you remember back to our mission statement, we govern the high school esports, so we can't do that. Um, we have to use the word invitational. It cannot include words such as varsity, season, championship, postseason, league, or playoffs. So again, we call ours varsity seasons. We call it a league. We call it a postseason and playoff. We call it a state championship. So we can only use the word invitational. So, and the reason why they did this is because they own partial um, a national league called play vs they own about 2.5 percent uh, they've paid about two million dollars to get that that percentage um, they want people to use that model and that model is a pay-to-play model it costs roughly 365 dollars uh, to to submit one league of legends team um, or if you want unlimited players it's about two thousand dollars a year um, so to give you an idea of what this does right is it pushes all of them into this pay to play model where we have tons of rural schools here in Wisconsin that are starting to compete 
And I would still say that there's maybe 90% of high schools that are competing here in the state of Wisconsin that don't have a budget. They don't have money to travel. They, some of them don't even have money to buy the game titles um, for their students. And some of them just don't have the money to, to compete. Um, so this has really crippled. This has removed League of Legends from nearly 12 states across the country. Um, so there are now thousands of high schools that cannot offer this, this game because of these new community guidelines that just came out. And it's not just high school, it's also college. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's huge. They're trying to push everybody in this pay to play model um, where if you know gaming, uh, in order to be top uh, for these national leagues, <clears throat> you essentially need to be like at least diamond two. Your whole team needs to be at least diamond two uh, to finish within the top like 200 of the country. Um, so for a lot of programs around the state that are just starting up, that they maybe have like bronze or silver level players, like they, they and I hate to say this, but they stand no chance of having a winning season ever um, in these. Like likely they will either go winless or maybe one or two wins. And that's, you know, that doesn't create a prolonged experience. Like imagine if your soccer team didn't win a single game for 10, 10 years or four years of your high school career, would you continue to try out for that team and participate on that soccer team? Most likely, no. What are some of the big downsides? I mean, besides these massive community guidelines that have come out, um, a lot of the question marks is people are asking, where is this revenue coming from? Um, trying to track the money within this, um, it's just a big question. There's a lot of online toxicity. Um, it's something that is at uh, our forefront. It's one of our, our main initiatives is to help remove that. There's a lot of lack of organization and certainty and job security. Um, and there's tons of competition. Everybody thinks right now that they can start an esports team and they can just recruit wherever they want and they can get whatever players. Like we've had some high school players approach with two to $300 contracts uh, per month, which if you're 14 and you're playing a game and you're thinking, oh my God, I can, I can make nearly four grand in a year, right? But there's a lot of predatory practices because kids are signing contracts and they don't know um, they don't have a lawyer look them over. They don't have their parents look it over. So they're a minor that's serving, uh, like signing a contract. Um, so there's, there's a lot of red flags. There's a lot of people that don't know how to legally approach some of this. Um, and it's getting some people into quite a bit of trouble. Uh, what's happening here in the state, right? Uh, colleges, there's over 145 colleges across the country that are offering some scholarship. There's maybe one or two colleges that I know of that offer full rides. Most of them are like anywhere from two to $7,000 scholarships. Uh, the Big Ten does have a quarter of a million dollars to provide scholarships for League of Legends. Uh, and that boils down to about $5,000 scholarships at, uh, at UW-Madison. Tons of career opportunities. It's great for students to get involved right now. Um, you don't have to, you know, your end goal doesn't have to be that you want to be a graphic designer within esports. It's using esports in order to hone your craft, build your portfolio, um, and just to get you some experience. Like, especially for broadcasting and videographer, like, there's tons of opportunities here um, that students can take advantage of. And there are some colleges that are offering scholarships for these. Um, not just playing the game, but they're looking for analysts, they're looking for community managers, they're looking for writers. Um, so there are a lot of other opportunities. Uh, the picture here was was when I was working at uh, for Microsoft, uh, and I got to go to this higher education conference in Chicago. There were colleges from all across the world. I talked to French colleges. I talked to English colleges um, who are all looking to start esports programs. And behind me is the Illinois State Redbirds official League of Legends team. So those guys got to just sit there for like three days and play video games. It was awesome. Uh, what games are colleges recruiting for is a pretty popular one. This is a short list. Um, there are even more, uh, and especially as new titles keep continuously coming out, this list is going to continue to grow here. Um, but I mean, you pretty much name it, there's, there's probably some sort of college scholarship around it. Uh, what's happening here in Wisconsin? Again, this started four years ago now. We started with seven schools playing League of Legends. Um, we now have I think my mailing list as of today, like my map over here is up to like 115 schools 
across the state uh, competing in Overwatch, Rocket League, Smash Brothers, and then we are currently working on figuring out what our fourth title is going to be uh, since Riot took our fourth away from us. So, um, uh, But there are about 12 other state associations. I run a lot of fun tournaments during the summer, and we have schools from Michigan, Ohio, uh, Indiana, Illinois, uh, and Iowa competing. So it's kind of fun. We're starting to see a lot more growth here in the Midwest. I would say the Midwest is leading right now the country in high school esports. Um, it started, I'm going to say it started in Illinois. Wisconsin was second, um, maybe third, depending on Indiana. Um, but I know I have helped. I've helped Michigan, Ohio, and uh, Texas, Nebraska, Missouri. I've I've tried to help a lot of them get established as well. Um, and then here, there are a lot of gaming cafes or gaming um, businesses that are starting to launch here. Uh, there's Tier 1 in Milwaukee, which is where Marquette University practices. Not Your Parents Basement in Racine, which is where the Racine Unified School District, they use that as their home base. Um, it's really cool to see they have like five teams that go to one place and they compete there. Um, Edge VR in Green Bay, Game On in Sheboygan. Um, so we're starting to see a lot more of these places uh, pop up, um, and it's it's really cool to see. Wisconsin Colleges, um, again, this is not even a complete list here. Like, I realize that I don't have Lakeland University on here. Um, Lakeland University is actually led, the program director there is Amon Green, who is a former Packer great running back. Um, it's awesome. Um, I get to I get to hang out with Amon Green once in a while, so I get to like have this like little kind of like a fanboy experience because um, I grew up watching him run for the Packers. Um, so right now uh, there aren't too many that are offering scholarships to my knowledge, but but like I said, there are going to be more and more. It is a great community to join um, when you're on a college campus. Like I know Whitewater and Stout are huge leaders in the state within gaming, um, and especially Stout has a game design program. So if you're interested, check out some of these colleges. Uh, if you want to get more involved, I do have, um, this is kind of just an overlay of what you could do uh, if you wanted to get something started at your school. I know I've talked to uh, a couple of students here previously. I've talked to um, some of your teachers about getting involved as well. But I mean, yeah, this is exploding considering we have about now 20% of the state participating. Um, of all high schools and we can even have middle schools competing. We allow middle school students to compete in our JV um, So that's really helpful to a lot of our smaller rural schools get involved within this But there's like I said, there's a top there's a ton that you can do um, And so right now I know I'm not there personally um, But this is your opportunity to go ahead and shoot me some questions um, I'll be joining you hopefully here in a little bit uh, as my class is getting out here, I can hop on a call real quick and answer any any of your questions in person. Um, but if you would like to right now, uh, until I jump in there, you are more than welcome to go ahead. You can either shoot me some email questions. You can uh, DM me questions on, on Twitter. Um, I might not get those as fast. Um, or if you want to just at me, that's fine. Um, if you want to like add, add our esports Twitter as well, if you want to you know, connect with me on LinkedIn, Discord, you want to watch our Twitch channel when we, when I can find time to stream games again. Um, right now I'm in kind of a weird situation to where I can't stream games because I have to be at school. I can't just run home to get to onto my PC and do a match of the week. So um, kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place there. So i um, trying to push my school right now to allow us to get a, a machine for streaming because I have like five students that are really excited to do some play-by-play -play broadcasting. And then I have a couple that are really interested in doing the graphic design work for the overlays and stuff like that. And there's, I'll be honest, there are some schools that are doing some really awesome stuff with broadcasting. Um, Milton High School is one of the first ones that I saw doing tons of work with broadcasting. Uh, big shout out to Racine Case uh, who their, their stream work is incredible. Um, if, if you want to take a look, go check out what Racine Case is doing. I would say they are the highest quality level of production in the state when it comes to esports or just streaming in general. So, um, but yeah, so if you have questions, I'll be there in a couple of minutes. Otherwise, sit tight and uh, I'll talk to you in a little bit. Thanks for hanging out.